Hey, everybody. So uh, thanks a lot for coming tonight. I'm, I'm really excited to be asking Daniel some questions. I've been a fan of his work for decades now. Um, I think it was uh, in the mid-'80s, uh, my wife and I were big fans of the comic book Love and Rockets. And my wife was coming back from the comic book store to pick up the latest issue of Love and Rockets when she also had a copy of this first issue of a comic called Lloyd Llewellyn. Mm -hmm. and, uh, she said, this looks great. She said, I cannot believe how cool this comic book is. And I'm like, oh, what do you mean? Let me check it out. We instantly fell in love with it, just the, the humor of it, uh, the, the outlook, and uh, the, the drawing style. Everything was just a, a fantastic package, and we fell in love with it. And uh, that was the beginning of this, like I said, decades-long love affair with the work of Daniel Klaus. So I'm really honored to be with him tonight to ask him some questions. And then after I'm done with uh, conversation after we've talked for a while, then we'd like to open it up to the to the audience and have you ask some questions. So anyway, why don't you come on out, Daniel? Yeah. Hello. Hey. So, uh, is this the first appearance you've had since the release of the book? Uh, I can't remember. Alvin, is it? Yeah. I feel weird being up here because I didn't. This, I didn't write a book about myself. <laughs> I want everybody to know that the uh, the actual author Alvin Buenaventura is right here. And uh... stand up, Alvin. He spent many years in my closet digging through <laughs> digging through stuff. Um, yeah, and uh, there's just b besides the, the fantastic art in the book, there's also great essays by a lot of uh, excellent writers, and just a wonderful, uh, uh, authoritative interview with Daniel that is just amazing. And uh, when I read it, I, I was thinking to myself, what possibly can I ask Daniel now after this? Because it was so good. But I'm, I'm sure we'll be able to I have Alzheimer's, so I can't remember anything that was in the interview. So. <laughs> Great. We'll, we'll start over. Um, yeah, just <laughs> and so my first question is, I'm just interested in your, your, the beginning of your relationship with comics. What, what did comics, what were, what were some of the first comics that you read as a child, and what kind of impact did they have on you? Well, I had a, bro a brother who was 10 years older than I was. And uh, when I was young, you know, three, four, five, I didn't have a television set. We didn't have, you know, video games. We didn't have any, anything, you know, we were, we were like, uh, you know, pioneers. We just had books and, <laughs> and uh, my brother left me his huge stack of comic books when he decided to, you know, go out and meet girls and become a hippie and put all, put all that aside. And so, that was, you know, my mom would say, go play in your room, read your comic books. And I would just go in and I had this stack of, you know, from 1955 to 65, Marvel Comics, DC Comics, Archie Comics, every kind of, you know, he just bought anything. He was totally indiscriminate. And I remember reading those, like, before I could read, you know, I was, like, looking at the images, like, trying to figure out what was going on and always imagining much more sinister things than actually were happening, you know, it's like if... Two people would be kissing. I'm like, why is she trying to bite him? Or <laughs> so I really, um, you know, they were, they entered my brain, you know, in a, at an early age in such a strong way. You know, they're just because they're all like these kind of evil images that are designed to like get kids to buy, you know, comics. And so there are these, they they're loaded with content. You know, they're all these like weird fairy tale kind of images and so it's they really stick in your head yeah one of uh, the <coughs> covers of a comic that you had when you were a kid that was reproduced in the book is one that shows water that's frozen kind of like the Kurt Vonnegut story but maybe it was right. actually done before that frozen he water ripped and them off <laughs> yeah and that really freaked you out yeah I don't know why I mean it, it had something to do with like it was a uh, it was it's this like you know nuclear family in there you know there, it, the sun is blaring down. It's like the hottest day. You know, it's like post global warming. And if only we could drink, but all the water is frozen, and they're trying to drink out of a drinking fountain. 
And I remember being so confounded by that image. I remember pounding my head against the wall. And my mom came in and was like, what's wrong? You know, and I was like, look at the, you know, <laughs> they're trying to drink and it can't be done. <laughs> I was, I've, I've, actually, I don't want to know, but I'm sure if I gave that, told that story to a psychiatrist, they'd have a lot to say about that. <laughs> you also, for a while, were, were uh, fascinated with Jack Chick's religious tracts. Well, how could you not be? <laughs> you know, I, uh, I spent a year of my life living in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is a very, like, fundamentalist Christian city. And those were all over the place. They were just like, it was like they used them for currency or something, you know. And, <laughs> and, uh, and one day, I, you know, I, I used to just read them here and there whenever I'd get them. And one day I, I thought, like, I should go, like, buy a bunch of these. These are, like, kind of awesome. And so I found a Christian bookstore, and I went in there, and I bought every single one off a spinner rack. It was like 100. And the lady was like, you know, we've saved another one. You know, she was very happy. I think she thought I was going to go hand them out at laundromats or something. And, uh, and I went home that night, and I sat down, and I'm going to read these. And I started reading them, and they're, they're, you know, it's like eating potato chips. And they take, you know, two minutes to read. And by the end of it, I was just, I felt like, okay, I've made some really bad decisions in my life. And I've got to call up Brother Chick and see if he can save me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So uh, I, I'm curious about how you developed your, your drawing style. What, what uh, artist influenced you when you were younger, and how did your style evolve through the years? It didn't really evolve. <laughs> no, no it, um, you know, I, I, I never really wanted my work to look like any other artist necessarily, but I wanted it to, to look really like Im impressive in, in the way that old comics look, you know, with those clean lines and the bold shadows, and just to have that kind of, you know, it's a comic kind of feel, you know, where it really, it's like on the borderline between like that kind of pop art iconography that the early comics have, where it's really just kind of, you know, aggressively in your face in a certain way, but then it's also representing reality in a certain way, and so it was really just a, a process of trying to learn how to do the lines, you know, how to, how to make the, the pages look as much as I could like old comic pages. I remember you were telling your parents that you wanted that special tool that would... Yeah, I think, I mean, there weren't any, like, books about how to do comics or anything like that when I was a kid. There was nothing. And so me and all my friends who wanted to draw comics, we were like, okay, they have a special pen. And we were sure it was like... A machine of like sort of half machine half pen that you'd connect to your wrist and it would like <laughs> help you make because how could you make a line like you know one of those like EC guys it's impossible there's no way that's like a freehand line so we were every week we'd go to the art store and we're like okay I think I've found it and, like I remember buying like a photo retouching pen because it was the most expensive pen it was like five bucks I remember bringing it home like this is it you know and oh it's not it and then, and then finally I read somewhere, some artist talking about how they used a brush. And I thought, like, well, oh, there's no way. No, they don't use, nobody uses a brush. That's crazy. And then, and then it turned out, like, yeah, they do use brushes. And I was like, oh, no. It's, like, worse than a pen. Like, what am I going to do? So I had to just start with the, you know, I mean, the first lines I drew with a brush were like, oh, God. You know, it was just horrifying. And so that's... But, so, you know, practice. You, uh, uh, you, you mentioned in, in the book that you switched, though, to a rapidograph when you were in, in art school. Oh, yeah. I had, a, I had like a, well, like before I went to art school, like I had no training or anything. And, and I really just wanted what I was drawing to look like, um, you know, like old EC comics, basically. And so I did, I like tried to use all the techniques, like using you know, Zipatone, which are those like black and white dots that you paste on artwork and using all this stuff to like sort of give it the surface look of those old pages, but without any actual skill underneath. So it was like, it was just, you know, it was just not working out. It was just like going in a really bad direction. And like one day I just thought like, I've got to just like start from ground zero. Like literally, like I, I saw people I knew who never had drawn, drawing for the first time, like when they were in their 20s, and they were so much better than I was. And I thought, it's because they just, they don't have any 
bad information that's cluttering up their brain, you know? And so I thought, like, I'm gonna just start with a rapidograph line, no penciling, simple, you know, just go from there, mm -hmm. build it up. And, and, and so that's in around like 1983, that's, that's where I started. Were there any cartoonists that you did not like as a child that you like now or admire now? Yeah, yeah. There, I mean, there were a lot of, uh, I mean, I, you know, I admire everybody now, you know, because it's, I remember when I was a kid looking at certain, like, mad artists who weren't, like, the great guys, you know, like mm -hmm. Dave Berg was always sort of like the B-list mad artist, and just thinking, like, yeah, one day I'll be better than Dave Berg, or, you know, like, thinking when I'm 12, I'll be, you know, I can be, and then, like, later realizing how deeply arrogant that is, and, like, no, Dave Berg's amazing, you know, it's like, all these guys are incredible. And to think that he had to do two two-page spreads once a month, too, is... About, about a, like, a, you know, lawn mowing or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy. You yeah. Just try it. <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, when did you start drawing for Cracked magazine? going to go there, are you? <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> Alvin, when was that? <laughs> I, have to, I literally like, I know more, Alvin and this other guy who wrote for the book, Ken Perrill, know more about me than I do. And whenever it's, there's like, like I'm writing a line of dialogue and I think like, I, I th feel like I've used that before. I'll email Ken Perrill, when have I used this line? And I'll go, well, that was in, you know, Lloyd Llewellyn number four. Um, oh, well, I think it was like the early 80s. It would have been, actually I do know, it's 85 because that was my first check I ever received. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is, just looking at, at some of your earlier work, your style in Cracked seems to be really developed and in a, in a strong direction that, that points to what you do now. Before that, it didn't look like that. What, what happened in, in, in that period of a few years? Well, being paid for it is <laughs> kind of a big part. I mean, I really felt like, uh-oh, I've got to like match up with John Severin and all these professional artists, mm -hmm. so I better, like, figure out what I'm doing. But, you know, at that age when you're, like, I was, what, like, 23 or 24, it's, like, it's like a, a little baby learning, you know, learning about the world or something. You know, it's like you're, you can develop so much in, like, three weeks. You can be, like, a totally different artist with, like, one or two little revelations, you know. It's like, oh, yeah. And you learn, you know, you learn all the, like, tricks of, like, how to make it look okay on the page and stuff. So, mm -hmm. did there's you a, have there's a few things in Cracked I would not, I don't think you'd be saying that about. <laughs> <laughs> did you have, did you have help or did you have a mentor at Cracked who? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a serious question? <laughs> um, no, I did. No, I, I, the reason I, uh, the reason I started working at Cracked was I had a had a roommate. Uh, named named uh, Mort Todd, which is not his real name, but he was a, uh, you know, he was just like a, my friend in art school and he was my roommate. And one day he was, uh, he was like uh, looking through the want ads, I think, in the New York Post. Like, you know, none of us had jobs at that time. We were right out of art school. And there was some job that was like Office Boy, Cracked Magazine or something like that. And I thought, like, I'm going to go take this job. And that after after like a week, they gave him like a slightly better job, and and then he uh, he sort of noticed that the editor at the time was just like totally phoning it in, like using old articles from the <coughs> '60s and stuff that like parodies of TV shows that weren't on anymore and, <laughs> and stuff like that. And, and so within like three weeks, he was the editor of the magazine. <laughs> and so. It, you know, I was his roommate. <laughs> and they, well, and actually I, I submitted work in that the publishers of the magazine didn't want to look like fools, like they would just print anything. So they, they would go through the batches of artwork and one day they just landed on my stuff and they went, this guy, this guy's no good, you can't use him. And so Mort told me that and I was like, oh no, what am I going to do, you know? And he's like, they, don't, they have no idea, just submit it under a different name. And so that's, I came up with a name for Cracked, which was Stosh Gillespie, which was, <laughs> my middle name is Gillespie, and my dad wanted to name me Stosh, so. Um, and so then the next week he brought it in, and the guys were looking through it, and they came to that, and they stopped for a minute, and, they, and he thought, oh no, they figured it out, but they went, 
Now this guy, this is the stuff you want to put in the magazine. <laughs> so luckily, it, it worked. Uh, now the Mort Todd character, was he, did you? <laughs> the Mort Todd uh, character, I mean, he was actually I, a human being. Yeah, but <laughs> the, the human being, the Mort Todd human as being. As unlikely as um, it may but, seem. But he was, uh, he became a character in, one, in Lloyd Llewellyn, didn't he? Was, wasn't he the Oh, he is somewhat, yeah. His, like his, his look, he was sort of, you know, that typical, like, you know, kind of round-headed guy with big corner and glasses. Mm -hmm. Did you, so how did the, the cracked it phase of your career come to an end? I think I finally got, like, better work and was, you know, didn't look back. I don't, it wasn't <laughs> like, you know. Nobody, uh, I had a friend who was like the art director for Cracked for 15 years and then <coughs> after uh, the company got bought and he lost his job and he was like, there's no other job after that. Like, nobody will hire you because you were the art director at Cracked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, because all, like, all the even worse magazines than Cracked weren't even around like sick and uh -huh. crazy and all that. And that's the only other job he could have gotten. Uh -huh. Yeah. Is so, Cracked still around? It's a website now. Yeah, it is. That's right. I, I think that's all. That's its only iteration, yeah. and I don't think it even acknowledges the comic. I don't know. I, mm -hmm. It's hard to figure out. Yeah, I wonder if they still use Sylvester. Is it Sylvester Smythe? Sylvester P. Smythe, yeah. you know, the most unappealing character who ever was invented. <laughs> so let's, let's move on to Lloyd Llewellyn. How did you come up with the idea, and who did you shop it around to before you send it to Fantagraphics? Well, I, I was, uh, when I was in art school, my whole plan was to like, there, there was no comics industry at all at that time. I mean, there was just nothing. There was like Marvel Comics and I just thought I would be, I would get work as like a magazine illustrator and then in my spare time I'd do these little comic kind of things that I was sort of starting to conceive and self-publish them or, or just, you know, do them for fun and show them to people or something. But my, my whole goal out of art school was to, uh, to be a magazine illustrator. And so I was spending my days like with my little portfolio I put together and you'd, what you do back then, you'd go to magazines and you'd leave it with a secretary and they would say like, you know, the art director will look at it at three o'clock and then we'll, you can pick it up tomorrow. And after a while, I started to realize, like, they're not even looking at these. Like, this is just a big scam, you know. And so I actually put in a little thing in the portfolio, a little piece of paper so you could tell if they actually opened it up. Never, <laughs> never, ever opened it. And they go, oh, it's great. Thanks so much. And so it was this really dispiriting time in my life. And I was like, oh, well, what am I going to do? You know, this is not working out. And so I thought, I'm just, the only thing I like doing is drawing comics. So I'm just going to draw a comic for myself. And I wanted to start that night. Like, I didn't want to plan it out or anything. So I was like, okay, what's a character? Okay, Lloyd Llewellyn has lots of L's. There's a guy. <laughs> he looks like this. I was actually watching an episode of Dragnet at the time, and there was, a, there was a white supremacist on there who had these really cool, like, green, green uh, sunglasses. And I thought, oh, he looks cool. I'll make, it, <laughs> make him look like that guy. And so, uh, and so I drew it, and, and then I thought, like, well, should be in color because comics are in color. Like I was just totally out of the loop about comics at that time. And so I colored it like an animation cell, like painting on the back, like in a way that could never be printed ever. <laughs> and, uh, and then I just thought like, well, what am I gonna do with this? And, and uh, so I went to the comic store for the first time in a long time. And there were all these like new companies printing like black and white comics. So I thought, well, I'll send it to them. And I sent it to two or three companies, and they would just send it back with this, like, no note or anything, <laughs> just like, here. <laughs> There's this huge, like, plastic thing that cost a fortune to mail in. And then, and then I, uh, I just recently learned about Love and Rockets. They were probably on issue, like, three or something. And all, all these people at the comic store said, this is great, you got to read this. And I thought, yeah, they told me that about a lot of stuff. I mean, and so finally I read that and I thought, oh, this actually is great. So I should send it to these people. And then I realized they also did the comics journal. And so I thought, oh, the comics journal, I'll send it to them. They'll look at this and send me back some feedback. Like I thought there were like banks of guys like sitting around, you know, ready to type up feedback for your, you know. <laughs> and so, uh, so I sent it in and never heard anything. It was like three, four weeks, and I actually totally forgot about it. 
and I was like sitting around on a Sunday afternoon and the phone rings and this guy goes, this is Gary Groth from the Comics Journal. And I, I thought, is he gonna try to like sell me a subscription or something? <laughs> and he was like, um, you know, would, how'd you like to have your own monthly comic? And I was like, what, You're like really? And I sort of felt like I really wanted to like jump through all these hurdles and like earn, earn this thing. And it's like, no, here you go, you know? It's like, it's just like, you know, it's like, well, I wrote, wrote down some ideas on a piece of paper and I, you know, showed it to somebody and, oh, I got a Nobel Prize, you know? It's like, <laughs> it was like, really felt, <laughs> and so I had to like, he's like, do you have enough material for like to do a monthly comic? And I was like, totally, yeah, for sure. You know, even though I've never thought about this character more than the 10 seconds it took me to make him up. <laughs> And so I, I remember at the time I had this idea, like I want to do a comic that's like all these different characters and ideas. And he's like, no, no, the only way we can sell a comic is they have to have a character. You've got to really like stick by your character. So we want it to be just Lloyd Llewellyn. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and of course that's totally wrong. But that was, that was like the, the wisdom of the, of the era mm -hmm. that you had to have like your character that you could draw at conventions. <laughs> so, how did how did Lloyd, Lloyd Llewellyn do? Um, it started out pretty good. It was um, it was actually in Love and Rockets. They put it in the magazine, which was I'm still embarrassed about. That. <laughs> I still want to apologize to those those poor fellows. But um, and, and it started out pretty good, and then it's like it slowly the sales were sinking, but the the issue on which it was canceled, I think it sold 7,000 copies, which was like more than like any black and white comic now sells. That's like, there's like DC comics that sell less than that. But at the time they were like, yeah, forget it. You know, it's not worth it. That, that wasn't enough, 7,000 wasn't Yeah, they were like, you know, let's, let's just stop it before it's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was like five issues? Six Lots issues, yeah. And were you able to get them out on a monthly no. basis? No. no. Not even close. Yeah. So what happened after that? What did you do uh, in between <coughs> Lloyd Llewellyn and 8-Ball? There was a lot a of crying. <laughs> <laughs> now I, was, I thought, like, well, there was my big shot, and oh well. And, uh, and so I thought, well, I want to do, like, one more comic. And I thought, like, maybe I'd have to publish it myself or something. And I thought, I just want to do, like, this one last comic that's just all the stuff I want to do. And just like one or two issues and, and then I'll go back to school, you know, and learn taxidermy or something. And, and, uh, and so I did, I did all of eight ball number one. And, and I, I thought like, well, Fantagraphics will never publish this, but they were, it's like I caught them in a, in a, where they were feeling sorry for me or something. And they said, okay, we'll, we'll do it. Why not? And, uh, and then of course that caught on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but not right away. And actually, the first printing of the first issue was very low. It was like 3,000 copies or something. But they stuck with it. Yeah, yeah. Did you, did you feel that 8-Ball was the comic you wanted to do all along? It, it sounds like... Kind of, yeah. 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 It, wouldn't have, you know, it wouldn't have been... I mean, I had no idea what I was doing with the first Lloyd Llewellyn. I mean, I'd never, I'd never done like a complete story before. You know, I used to, like in high school, I'd start a comic, and I'd do three pages always. And then I go, oh God, this is horrible. <laughs> and I start it over. Often I do the same story like 15 times, and oh, it's horrible. Never. And just then, by then, you're so burned out on it. It's like, well, I'm not going to finish this. And so, really, the Lloyd the Wallen stuff was the first thing I had ever done more than like four or five pages. Mm -hmm. So it was really like I had to just learn how to do that. Uh, so. You obviously have, have grown and, and matured with your comics a great deal since then. Um, but I'm thinking that there's a couple of things that, that have happened to you that probably have had an effect. One is that you had major heart surgery. Um, you know, how that did that helped. change your uh, perspective <laughs> on, on the, the kind of <laughs> subject matter that you deal with? I don't know. I mean, it's not something, you know, I, I don't think about that kind of stuff consciously, you know, like, I'm going to deal with my heart surgery, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's the kind of stuff that seeps into the work, you know, mm -hmm. you have to, like, not think about it too much, mm -hmm. or it gets, you know, it feels wrong, it feels forced, you got to 
you got to just let these stories happen and they have to feel spontaneous. And so I might look back on it later and go like, oh, yeah, that's obviously about my heart surgery. But Yeah, sure. And also having a, a kid, obviously, I, I know, too, it. that that changes the way you look at the world. I mean, for me, having a kid, like prior to having my son, I always thought that uh, I was always on the uh, the nurture side of the nature versus nurture argument. Like I always thought that like people are just these like blobs of clay and they're molded into whatever they are. And to watch my son just be this totally unique, independent person from minute one and grow into that and have that, that I have almost no effect on him at all <laughs> is was really you know I realized like neurology is a lot more important than than I give it credit for. You know, I'd always been on the like psychology mm -hmm. side of the, of the equation. And so it's, you have to rethink how you create characters if you think of them in terms of like, they are inherently this guy and not necessarily made that way. Yeah, yeah. It was interesting back in, in uh, before we, we came up here, you were telling me your son is really interested in making things and electronics and yeah, you have no like, idea where it comes I from. No, and I, I have no knowledge. I mean, he knows more than I do about all these, like, circuit boards and stuff, you know, and he's like, you know, he's, he's always asking me to help him, and I'm like, it's just like my brain can't even grasp this. <laughs> what are you doing? What is that? It's like, Dad, it's a NAND circuit. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in the interview, in your monograph, you said that you were disgusted by the, quote, great graphic novels you've seen, unquote. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> well, can, can you talk a little bit about that? I felt that? safe when I said that in my own <laughs> studio. <laughs> uh, you know, it's that, that, just that whole thing of, like, and I'm not going to name any names, but just the, the, like, you know, the graphic novel boom where everybody's got like an important subject, like it, like where you feel like the graphic novel was sold with a, like a pitch of like, I'm going to like, you know, write about this geopolitical situation. And it says, I don't trust any cartoonist who does that because we don't know anything. You know, it's like we have to spend all our time just learning how to like letter, you know, how to use an Ames guide. It's like we don't have time to like bone up on history and stuff. You know, it's like that's... Uh, like, it's like with political cartoonists, I'm always really distrustful of political cartoonists because it's like, why, who, what, why does your opinion matter at all? <laughs> <laughs> um, a, a couple of times in your, semo, in, in your semi-autobiographical strips, especially the ones in 8-Ball, the, the Klaus-like character has a, a startled look <laughs> and, and says something like, why does e anyone care about made-up plot lines and characters when they have their own lives to lead? Do you still? still yeah, I still feel that way. <laughs> it's still shocking to me. Well, why do I care, you know? Mm -hmm. I do. Yeah, well, I think a lot of, a yeah. lot of people care, though. It does seem strange, though, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. So, uh, we've been talking for... <laughs> <laughs> the <about> end. <laughs> We've been to, I, I thought it would be a good time to open it up to, uh, to other folks. All right. <laughs> See if other people have any questions. Sure. And, and speak loudly, yeah, please, you when you ask questions. There's a sea don't of have microphones. blank faces behind you. Uh, I was just wondering how the Wilson movie was coming along. Well, I'm, I'm writing a uh, new draft. So it's, it's progressing, yes. And how is it with, uh, working with the director? He's great, Alexander yeah. Payne. Yeah. He's great. He's, I, we're, we're both born in 1961, and it's weird how you have like a shorthand with somebody <laughs> when you're born in the same year. It's like, like, you know, when we were growing up, it's like a new TV show appeared that year, and it was like important to you at that age and all that stuff. And n now there's like so much stuff, it's, I don't think that means as much, but at that time, it's, it really meant a lot. So we just have, it's like we're brothers because we were both grew up in 1961. It's, yeah. it's very odd. <laughs> Anybody uh, else? If you if you have a question, uh, raise your hand high. And in the meantime, we uh, can't see past like the third row. So I'm going to throw one out at you guys while we're waiting uh, for a couple hands to go up. Which is, you were discussing the fact that you both were in an Errol Morris ad together. Is that correct? I, I was just curious what that experience was like. 
Yeah, we were we were trying to remember the last time we saw each other, and uh, we had we were both in one of those Errol Morris um, Apple commercials. Yeah, the switch ad. The switch ad, which was, was funny because I'd never switched. I would, I I just <laughs> bought what my uh, I had like a guy doing all my computer stuff. I never touched a computer and then he moved and I was like, well, what am I going to do? <laughs> and so he like b bought me, you know, I, I paid for it, but he bought me like the exact computer that I needed to use and wrote just a list of all the stuff I need to do that for years I just followed his flow chart. So I was like the worst guy to be asking about like, what kind of computer do you use? I have no idea. That was a straight week. It was a very strange day. Yeah, I remember uh, Chaya Day was the advertising agency. They told me to come in at like 10 in the morning. So I went to this big, huge sound stage in, in here in Hollywood. And there was somebody with a clipboard, and they said, oh, yeah, you are on at noon. So I'm glad you're here now. And I said, can I sit somewhere? And all the Chaya Day people had like their laptops on chairs with like pieces of paper taped to it that said, do not touch. And so yeah, like, I couldn't sit anymore. So I, I just sat outside, and then that's where I saw you. Oh, yeah. And so then at noon, they said, okay, you're on. But then all of a sudden, Danny Elfman came walking in. And, and so they <coughs> took like three hours with him. I, I finally went on like at 7 or 8 o'clock at night. Really? Yeah. I, I don't think remember. They, they pushed you in front of me. Yeah, I think I was, I was on after an, a teenage ice skater whose name was Sasha Cohen, but it wasn't Sasha Baron Cohen. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was actually looking at a list years later of all the people who were in that ad, and it was like, oh, man, I could have met Sasha Baron Cohen. <laughs> and I realized, oh, it's an ice skater. And, and Errol Morris had this really weird uh, s the setup called the Interatron that he uses to interview people. And it's like a, he's on a, a – it's like the Wizard of Oz. He has a larger-than-life – face staring at you and the camera shooting through a teleprompter and his face is on the teleprompter and he asks you these questions in a very aggressive way and he's like you know what's it like using a windows computer and i yeah. said it's like being in a bad relationship and he's like a bad relationship <laughs> and everything he said challenged yeah, he's you. trying to get you people like us to be animated you know <laughs> yeah. I was like <laughs> scared up there and you're like you're just in this like white world you know where there's just no space at all and you just think like this is so uncomfortable like I just want to get out of here yeah your so your commercial is uh, on your YouTube channel now well I should say on Alvin's YouTube channel yeah. which I don't know how to operate what's it what's the the channel it's called DanielKlaus.com. Oh, okay, DanielKlaus.com, all spelled out. On Which I don't even have the password for. I don't even know how to, <laughs> what how to whatever do anything. Alvin, whatever, Alvin could really destroy my reputation. <laughs> so, any other questions? There we go. There we uh, go. Let's start with the gentleman in red. Any chance of a David Bourne movie? Because after reading that, I absolutely loved it and I could imagine it being a film. Is there any chance of that in the future? You know, there's uh, people have asked about it. So, maybe, someday, yeah. Never say never. <laughs> and right behind him, yes. Um, before you were, we were talking about, you were talking about Mad Magazine. Can you talk a little bit more about how More. <laughs> I thought we did a lot on that. Um, about how, you know, I'm sure you have a lot to say about how it influenced you um, reading it. Mad Magazine? Mad Magazine, and maybe some of, who some of your favorite contributors um, well, I mean, you know, I grew up reading like the kind of the bad Mad Magazine from the 70s. It's like if you meet somebody like me, you can name any movie from the 70s and you can say the Mad parody title. It's like, oh, the Poop Side Down Adventure. <laughs> and so, and actually whenever I hear any movie from the 70s, I immediately think of Rose Mia's Boo Boo. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, but, um, but to me, you know, those were those were the good old mads, you know, because I was 10 years old and I had a subscription and waited, you know, came home from school every day. Where did I get it? Did I get it? You know. But later, I in there was an issue of Mad that it was called the Nostalgic Mad, and they printed some old Mad comics, and I was like, what are these? Like, why is it a comic? It's like they were color comics from the 50s, and I was like, why? Mad's always been this black and white thing. What are these? And Finally, you know, years later, figured out it had started as a comic. And when I finally saw those comics when I was like 16 or 17, those to me were like the greatest things I had ever seen. You know, I just thought, look, those are like the pinnacle that could never be reached. 
in terms of just the the greatness of these artists. You know, Will Elder being the greatest of the great, and Wally Wood, Harvey Kurtzman, of course. Um, speaking of EC Comics, I've heard people say that your style reminds them of Bernie Krigstein, but was that a conscious influence at all? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I was like obsessed with him when I was, you know, in high school. Mm -hmm. As much as you could be when two stories were available. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But, you know, I studied those two stories. Yeah, pretty yeah. amazing stuff. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, Steven Weissman. Uh, <laughs> a minute ago you were talking about how you're, after having a, a child, that your understanding of, of how people work, nature versus nurture, and I was wondering if you would elaborate uh, a little bit on, on maybe when that changed for you and, and what approach you might be taking now. I think, you know, it's not, it's not something that I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to set out and I have this process that involves, you know, analyzing nature versus nurture or anything. It's just in terms of, you know, when you're creating characters, as you know, they, they just sort of emerge as, as characters and you kind of try to figure out who they are. And I think in the past I would have tried to figure out like what, what, you know, situation made this person the way he is. And now I'd be much more inclined to think, no, he is just, that's how he is. Does that make you more sympathetic towards I think so, yeah, which is unfortunate, because I think <laughs> it's more fun to, to be unsympathetic. Uh -huh. I think it's more fun to kind of blame, blame the characters for their problems. But now you have to sort of think like, well, you can't help it. That's yeah. just how he is. Well, it's harder work, I think, too. Yeah. But, it, but it yields a, a richer story. And I think that's evident in your, your more recent work. Oh, thanks. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, as the public, we get to see your finished product that you have selected and chosen to put out in front of the world. And I'm curious a little bit about your own filtering process for work that you do. And you talked a little bit about whether something feels genuine or right to you. How effective is your filter in deciding a path you're going on is going to work? Or have you gone really far on, into a project and set it aside? And what are the reasons you find for kind of losing steam on, on certain stores? You know, um, I mean, the only real filter is like, do, do I feel like getting up and going and working on it? You know, and that's like, if you really like every day you get up and you think like, oh, I can't wait to like work on that. It's, you know, it's fun to do that. That's usually the only thing you can trust. And I've done a few things where I, it's like, I knew like, this will be a big, important story. And I'll be, you know, I'll be really proud of this when I'm done, but just hated <laughs> doing it. And just like, it was a chore. And I thought like this, that can't be right, you know, even though I know like a certain type of person would really respond to it, it's like it, that's not a reason to do it. It's like you got to really be guided by your own instincts and, and think like, would I, if I was in the comic store, would I buy this? You know, would I go like, I don't know who this guy is, but I want to read this, you know. That's, that's what you have to think. Have you ever abandoned work that you've done quite a bit of, quite a few pages on? I, you know, I've written things that were hours and hours, weeks and weeks of writing, and then abandon it. Mm -hmm. And I, there's, I did one, I have like a six page story that I think the story is actually good, but it was part of like a huge graphic novel thing that I just did not want to do after that six page story. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of abandoned. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, that's the most pages I ever drew that I didn't print. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Sorry. I, we all pointed at different sorry, people. Yeah, I apologize. You, you pick from now uh, on. Let's Blair. start with you. Yeah. Uh, Daniel? Yes. Stanley has a new line of clothing with your design. Can you talk about how that collaboration came about? Uh, I don't know if the guy's still. I was talking to the guy today who I met for the first time. He just, uh, there's a guy at Stussy who likes alternative comics. And he just gets us all to do t shirts at some point. <laughs> and it was my turn. <laughs> <laughs> And it's very easy. You just like do whatever you want, and we'll give you money. That's, that's what you like. <coughs> what was the OK uh, Soda experience like? That was a very strange experience because it was, you know, like art directors and ad agencies will send you stuff. You know, and the, we want you to work on this project, and they they sent me and Charles Burns got got the like stuff for OK Soda. 
And it was just so like, there's no way this is ever going to happen. Like we called each other, but like, this is like the most idiotic, like they would never do this, would they? And he was like, no, of course not. And so we're like, this is, this is like free money just doing this thing. And then all of a sudden the next thing you know, like, yes, it's out in stores and stuff. And it was just such a odd thing. And it's, you know, it's the only time in history I think that's ever happened where they tried to sell a product by being honest and sort of downplaying it and, mm -hmm. and like, you know, trying to just not not sell it in a way. Yeah. And, and there's a reason that doesn't work. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I've always been sort of proud because I heard that lost like many millions of dollars for the Coca-Cola Corporation. Uh, so, <laughs> an interesting experiment. They sent cool. a case of it to Wired Magazine when I was there. Oh, we, really? We wow. fought over it. It, was, uh, it didn't really taste very good. No, though. that was, that was the, sort of the main problem. I remember like when it first began, I was like, now what kind of, is it like root beer or something? And they're like, we don't know yet, we don't know. And I was like, well, what color is it going to be? I, we, we haven't decided. We've tested orange and that didn't work. It was you know, like so it was all just like they were, that was not at all what it was about. They were just like, any soda will work. It's all about this weird ad campaign. Yeah, yeah, I think so. It yeah. wasn't the, the flavor. Uh, yes. Oh, oh Steve. Me? Yes. Mr. G. Sorry. Um, yeah, I was just wondering about, you know, you're doing the comics and you're pretty much your own person when you do that, but then you work in the movies, it's all really collaborative and you sort of lose a, a lot of control doing that. How do you, how does that, how does it compare and how do you kind of compare to get used to that, you know, and working with Alexander, who's a really, you know, talented director? I mean, you know, you when you work in comics, you do have the blessing of having total control, nobody telling you what to do. I mean, I don't even ever have an editor. I've never had anybody even point out like a spelling error. <laughs> it's just like you send it off into the ether and that's it, you know. And, and uh, but that's also like you kind of wish sometimes like, I wish somebody would read this and say like, good job or, you know, <laughs> or like, you need to work on it or, you know, something like that. So it's working in the movies, you really get that to the nth degree, of course. but. You know, you always, you always hear stories of screenwriters who are so sad because their, you know, their movie got made and it's very different than what they wrote. And I always thought, like, well, why do they care so much? And then I thought, like, oh, if I didn't, wasn't able to like go back home and draw my comics, I would that that would be devastating if that was like the only creative outlet I had, and somebody destroyed it and ruined it. You know, that would be horrible. But somehow the fact that it's not makes it like I don't. It doesn't bother me. I just. I do the script and that's fun for me to do and when that's done, that's, I'm done, you know, here it is and whatever you do with it, that's your problem, you know. So that's, you know, I, but I'm very lucky that I get to go back in the studio and I'll show them. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes, I'm so sorry, gentlemen in the glasses. Right. You may have just answered my question, but I was going to ask, do you think that the modern technology has had a damning effect on the printed word and the printed, printed image, uh, like comic books, sequential art, and so on? Well, I don't, you know, to some degree, it's you know, it's certainly made people, uh, you know, it's it's a less vital art form than it used to be. You know, it's. It feels like books feel like it, they're becoming this sort of niche market as opposed to like a mainstream thing. And so it's, it's you know, things are changing in that way. You know, I feel like I, I know I'm always going to be interested in books, so I hope there's like 10 other people like me left <laughs> who, are, who are willing to buy $1,000 books when that... You know. And if you're in the back and you have a question, uh, like Carol Ann and Poltergeist, you must step into the light. We, we cannot see you. I'm terribly sorry. Oh, and there is someone back there and everyone is gesturing at them, so speak up. <laughs> um, I have a question. Great. Yes, voice in the darkness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you had a really good run with like New Yorker and, and Harper's with, con with consecutive covers, which I noticed they kind of changed up their style. And um, often I'd be intrigued by the image that you chose to illustrate for that particular <coughs> cover. Can you talk about the plot process you go through for those kinds of assignments? To do a New Yorker cover? Um, and, and Harper's, you know, I've never done Harper's. Really? Yeah. I wish. But um, 
You know, it's usually like the, the art director of The New Yorker, the cover art director is Francoise Mouly, who used to be the editor of Raw magazine. So she's totally, you know, in our world. She understands, you know, what we can all do. And so she'll get, there'll be like an issue where, sh where she'll say this might be, you know, something that you might, might have an idea for. And it always, when I'm talking to her on the phone, I always feel like, oh yeah, that's going to be so easy. It's just going to like, I'll do it in 10 minutes, I'll have an idea. And then it's like weeks and weeks and weeks of trying to get that thing to work. It's very, very tough to get those New Yorker covers to work. And then there's... Speechless? Yeah, it's like, it's a certain kind of... It's, it's like it's not quite a joke, it's like an image that tells a story that, that you have to read and then sort of it has to take like a beat before you kind of process what's happening. And it's like, but then there's some artist on The New Yorker who can just draw like some like snowfall and that's fine. And it's like, why can't I draw a snowfall? Whenever there's a cover like that, it's like a parking meter. It's like, come on, I would struggle to come up with some timely joke, you know, but it's, it's fun. It's always, that's the one thing I ever do that like my relatives and people like the neighbors and everybody are really impressed. Like, wow, New York recovery. So it's reason enough. Let's thank uh, Mark Fraunfelter and of course uh, a big round of applause for Daniel Klaus. And uh, I believe there is a signing directly after this panel, so uh, please uh, feel free to uh, stop by. Uh, thank you again to Meltdown Comics for hosting this event. Have a great night, everybody.